Okay, in this video we're going to be looking at the fundamental theorem of algebra. We're going to see how it applies to helping us determine the number of uh, solutions, the number of zeros that a polynomial has. But first, let's review quadratics for a second. Uh, recall that a quadratic, if we were to graph it, there's one of three scenarios that can come up. The first scenario is where the quadratic has two x-intercepts. And that would mean that there would be two real solutions. Now, we can determine that by not having to graph it by looking at the discriminant. Remember, the discriminant is when we're doing the quadratic formula. It's the portion that's underneath the square root. So if that portion is greater than 0 under the root for the quadratic formula, we know that there's also two real solutions. Now, there's another scenario that could happen. And that would be if there is exactly one x-intercept, meaning there's one real solution. And in that case, if you are using the quadratic formula and you get the discriminant equaling exactly 0, meaning what's under the radical is exactly 0, then you know that there's one real solution. And lastly, the third scenario that could come up is that if we were to graph it, there could be no x-intercepts. And we say in that case that there's no real solutions. Or you could do the flip side and say that there is two non-real solutions. And in that case, the way that you can determine that without having to graph it is if you get a discriminant, if you get a square root of a negative number, so if under the square root you get a negative number, a number less than 0, then you have a situation where there's no real solutions, or there's two non-real solutions. Now going back to that middle graph, we can say that, let's say the, that equation for that graph was what we have here, that f of x equals x minus 3 quantity squared. Now looking at that equation, we could find the 0 by setting that equal to 0 and get that um, a 0 there would be 3, because 3 minus 3 gives us 0. Remember, when we square something, that means that there's two of them. So we would have x minus 3 times x minus 3. Now, I don't want to list 3 twice and say that I have a 0 at 3 and another 0 at 3. So the way we describe that is we say it's a double 0 or a 0 of multiplicity 2. And that brings us to our fundamental theorem of algebra. Basically, what the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us is that any po if, we have, if we're working with a polynomial of degree n, as long as that degree is greater than or equal to 1, with complex coefficients, so the numbers next to the variables are complex numbers, then the function has at least one complex 0. So that tells us that if there's a, if a degree 2, for example, that there has to at least be two complex zeros. Well, that brings us to the next theorem, which is the number of zeros of a polynomial theorem, which the way the book describes this is it says a polynomial of degree where, again, n is greater than or equal to 1 with complex coefficients has exactly n complex zeros if multiplicities are counted. In other words, the way that I would describe that is over here on the left, and that's this, that the degree tells you the total number of complex zeros. So if the degree is 7, I know that for a polynomial, I know that there's a total of seven complex zeros. Now, some of them can be real and some of them could be non-real. Maybe all of them are real. Well, let's look at this example. Let's, before we get to the example down here, let's look at the one that I hand wrote here. x plus 3 quantity squared times x minus 2 to the fourth power. Anytime we have something in factored form here, finding the zeros are going to be rather simple with, and their multiplicities. Because we can see here that one of the zeros is going to be negative 3. Because if I set this factor up equal to 0 and subtract 3, I would get negative 3 as my answer. So one of the zeros is negative 3. Now the degree for that, poly or that factor gives us the multiplicity. Kind of like the previous example where we looked at that middle graph where we had x minus 3 equals 0. x minus 3 squared equals 0. So this one has a multiplicity of, th of 2. The other factor, the x minus 2, from that I can get that uh, another 0 would be a positive 2. In that case, the, the degree there for that factor is 4, so it would be a 2 would be our 0 with multiplicity 4. So if we were asked to find the, uh, the zeros and their multiplicities when it's in factored form, it's really easy. Now, when it's in standard form, it's not quite as easy. Now, we haven't talked yet about graphing. We're going to be, or about factoring. We're going to be looking at factoring in uh, some future videos. Or maybe you're familiar with, with factoring, and so um, 
when we look at the ends of these two examples, I'll show you what the factored form would look like. Because if we had this in factored form, again, that's going to be a lot easier. But if it's not in factored form, we need to, know, we need to use some of the uh, concepts and some of the tools that we're already familiar with. For example, when I look at this first example, we have x cubed minus 24x squared plus 144x. I see that each term has an x, so I'm going to start by factoring out an x. When I do that, I get x squared minus 24x plus 144. When we factor out the GCF, the greatest common factor, you should be able to, after you factor it out, distribute it and get the original equation. And sure enough, if I were to multiply these three terms by x, I would get the original x cubed minus 24x squared plus 144x. So again, my goal here is to find all the zeros. Now, one of the zeros I can get from right here. Because if I had this equal to 0 now, one of the zeros would be, if I just focus on that factor, the x, set that equal to 0, I would get x equals 0 with the multiplicity of 1. Now, the next half, the, or the other factor, the x squared minus 24x plus 40, 144, that is not in factored form. That's in... Uh, that's as, written as a quadratic. So up in this, till this point, the only way for me to simplify this would be to use a quadratic formula. So I'm going to use the opposite of b. The opposite of negative 24 is a positive 24. And then it's going to be plus or minus the square root of 24 squared. Now, 24 squared, you're going to need your calculator for that, but that ends up giving you uh, 576. And it's always minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 144. And all of that is divided by 2 times a. a, in this case, is 1, so it's just divided by 2. Now, when I go to simplify what's under the radical, remember, that is called the discriminant. When I dis find the discriminant there, negative 4 times 1 times 144 is negative 576. So I end up with 576 minus 576, or 0. And the square root of 0 would be nothing, so 24 plus or minus 0 would just be 24. which ends up being 12. So the fact that I got a discriminant of 0 here, if I go back up, tells me I have a situation like this, where I have one real solution. Now, it's also like that other one. It's also like the one that we talked about, where we would have a multiplicity of 2 then. So the fact that I got 12 as my answer, and that was my only one, tells me that that has a multiplicity of 2. Now, like I mentioned, that could be factored down further. That original function, the x squared minus 24x plus 144, technically that piece could be, uh, to, could be factored to be x minus 12 quantity squared. So that whole thing would factor down to be x times the quantity, x minus 12 squared. And when it's in factored form, again, you can see that it's a lot easier to find the 0 here. The 0 would be 12 with the multiplicity of 2. And finally, before we move on, the last thing to always check and make sure of is the degree for your polynomial here is 3. So that means that the total number of zeros should add up to be 3. So we have a 0 with a multiplicity of 1. We have the 12 with a multiplicity of 2. So we found all of our zeros. Let's look at the next one. The next one, you can see that we have a common factor here between each of these terms of t to the 13th power. So that's what we're going to start by factoring that out. So we'd have t to the 13th power. That would leave us with 9t squared because I'm factoring out t to the 13th. That means I'm left with two more t's. So it would be t squared minus 6t then. And then this would just be, originally this is 1t to the 13th. So when I factor out t to the 13th, I'm left with 1. Because remember, when I get to this step, if I wanted to go backwards, I should be able to distribute and get the previous answer. So if I were to say, well, when I factor out t to the 13th, if I would have put 0 here, well, t to the 13th times 0 is 0, not t to the 13th. t to the 13th times 1, however, gives us that original piece, that t to the 13th. So now I'm going to set each of these pieces equal to 0 to figure out my zeros. Well, the first part there is real easy, t to the 13th. If I were to set that equal to 0, I just get t equals 0 with a multiplicity. This time, the multiplicity is there are 13. My exponent there is 13, so it's got a multiplicity of 13. To figure out my other 0 or zeros, I need to use a quadratic formula. Now, this one's going to be a little bit easier. We're working with smaller numbers here. So b is a negative 6. The opposite of that would be a positive 6. 
plus or minus the square root of b squared, which would be 36, minus 4 times a, which is 9, times c, which is 1. All of that is divided by 2 times a. a is 9, so 2 times 9 is 18. So now let's simplify that. Let's find the discriminant, the piece under the radical. Well, 36, so 4 times 9 times 1 is 36, so 36 minus 36 is 0. So this is just like the previous example where our discriminant is 0. So there's only one real solution. That means it's got a multiplicity of 2. So 6 plus or minus 0 leaves us with just 6 in the numerator over 18. That reduces to 1 third. So this one's got a multiplicity of 2. So again, our multiplicity should add up to be our degree of our polynomial. So 13 plus 2 is 15. So I know I found all the zeros. Now just a side note, let's say if for some reason this had simplified to be 6 plus, this, uh, this plus or minus the square root of 81. So we'd get 9 as our answer. Then we would end up with zeros of, well, 6 plus 9 is 15. So we'd have 15 divided by 18, which reduces, that reduces to, because 3 goes into there, so 5, 6. That would have a multiplicity of 1 then. Our other 0 would be 6 minus 9, or negative 3 eighteenths, which reduces to negative 1 6. That also has multiplicity of just 1. So I just want to make sure that, that, would, that that's clear, that if you do end up with a root, you don't have to worry about how, what the multiplicities are. The multiplicities there would just be we'd have two real solutions. In this case, one of them would be 5 6, and the other one would be negative 1 6. And so if we were to add those two plus the 13, you'd end up getting 15. But that was if the case was where we got... Um, the square root of 81, which is not what happened here. I just wanted to make sure that that point is clear. Okay, let's look at this last part of our notes here. From the graph of a polynomial function, you can always determine information about its degree. And we can use what's called the polynomial graph wiggliness theorem. Yes, yeah, someone had fun naming that theorem. Uh, but that's just describing the way that the it's given there in the, in the book, there, the way that that's defined, it's kind of confusing. Basically, all it's saying is that we can find the smallest possible degree of a polynomial by drawing a horizontal line. And we'd want to draw a horizontal line and try to find where can you draw a horizontal, li horizontal line and have the most um, intersections with the graph. And if you count up those intersections, that gives you the smallest degree of the polynomial. So, for example, let's look at this one here. It says polynomial functions are graphed below. What is the lowest possible degree of each function? So, you don't want to look at the x-axis. I want to be able to draw my own line and find where can I draw my own line where it's going to intersect that graph the most times. Well, if I draw a line somewhere around here, I end up with one, two, three, four, five points of intersection. That means the lowest possible degree, or the least degree, for this particular graph would be 5. This graph is not related to an equation with a degree less than 5. So the smallest degree here would be 5. For this one, it's a pretty tight curve, but if you draw a line, a horizontal line, we get 1, 2, three points of intersection. So for this one, my lowest possible degree would be three. So that's a pretty simple concept there. The last thing that I want to talk about in this video is this idea of the conjugate zeros theorem. The most important, there, important, most important piece there is this fact that I have highlighted that if z is a plus bi, if that's a zero of a polynomial, then its conjugate is also a zero, the polynomial. And we'll get to how we can use that here in a second. But let's show that 2i is a zero for this polynomial. The way that we would do that is we would substitute 2i into that function. So it's going to be 3 times 2i cubed minus 2 times 2i squared plus 12 times 2i minus 8. Now let's review some facts about i for a second here. If we have, we know that i squared is negative i. I'm sorry, i squared is negative 1, rather. i squared is negative 1. Well, we could take from that and say, well, i cubed is going to be negative i. 
What happened here? It's going to be negative i. Here's how you can figure that out. i times i, we know, is i squared, which is negative 1. Well, if I have i cubed, that means I have i times i times i, so it means I take that negative 1 times i to get negative i. Now, if you had i to the fourth power, We had i to the fourth power. Well, that's the same as i times i times i times i, or i squared times i squared. Well, i squared is negative 1. So negative 1 times negative 1 would give me a positive 1. So i to the fourth power would be a positive 1. So those are some unique situations. So again, we know that i squared is negative 1. So we can use that to figure out that i cubed would be negative i. And i to the fourth power, if we had to do that, would be a positive 1. So let's use that fact, those facts now to simplify this. First off, 2i, when you cube that, becomes 8i cubed. This will become 2i squared is going to be 4i squared. You can multiply those together and just get 24i minus 8. So our final answer here when we go to simplify this, well, 8 um, i cubed, we said that i cubed again is negative i. So 3 times, so this is, 8i cubed is the same as negative 8i times 3 would be negative 24i. i squared is negative 1, so this is the same as negative 4 times 2 would be a positive 8. And then we have minus, I'm sorry, we have plus 24i, and then we have minus 8. If we simplify that, negative 24i plus 24i is 0, 8 minus 8 is also 0. So we got zero as our answer. So we've just verified that 2i is a zero for that polynomial. Now when it says in part b, we're not going to go through this huge process because it is a long process and I'm not going to be expecting you to be able to do all of that yet. Um, so we're not going to worry about finding part b. But I do want to talk about the first part. If we know that 2i is a zero of the polynomial, that means its conjugate is also going to be another zero. So two of the zeros here would be 2i and negative 2i. Because if you think of 2i as being the same as 0 plus 2i, the conjugate of that would be 0 minus 2i, or just negative 2i. So if you notice, I have two zeros. There's supposed to be a total of three. So we'd have to go through a rather long process to get to that third zero, which we're not going to worry about, like I said, uh, right now for the purpose of this video or for this lesson. So that's where we're going to end this. Again, the most important pieces here is to understand that we can find the smallest degree of a polynomial by using that horizontal line and drawing a horizontal line uh, to find the most points of intersection would give us the smallest degree of the polynomial. And knowing this, under, uh, and knowing this idea of multiplicities. And if it's in factored form, that's the easiest way to find the multiplicities. But if it's not in standard form, we have to use what we already know by factoring out a greatest common factor and then if it's a quadratic, using the quadratic formula. But with that, good luck now as you work on your assignment.